Thank you. I'm going to call uh, to order the meeting of the California State University Board of Trustees. Before I ask her, uh, I'd like to congratulate our very own Michelle Kiss on her appointment as the new trustee secretariat. Uh, we look forward to working with her in this new role, and uh, you're already doing great work keeping us out of trouble. And if your chair would just keep this place on time, you'd be in a much better uh, in a much better position. So we're, we're grateful for that already. So with that, uh, Miss Kiss, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Okay, here we go. Trustee Abrego, here. Speaker Atkins, Trustee Brewer, here. Governor Brown, Trustee Day, here. Trustee Eisen, Trustee Fagan, here. Trustee Farrar, here. Trustee Fortune, here. Trustee Garcia, Trustee Kimbell, here. Trustee Monville, here. Trustee Morales, Lieutenant Governor Newsom, Trustee Norton, here. Trustee Stepanek, here. Trustee Taylor, here. Superintendent Peterson, Trustee White, and Chancellor White. Present. Chair Monville, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Kiss. Excellent. Um, this is the time in which the board hears from public speakers. Uh, we will proceed with a maximum 30-minute period for public comments. Uh, speakers have two minutes for their remarks. When a speaker's time ends, uh, I would ask that uh, you yield the microphone to the next speaker so they may address the board. We want to make sure everybody has their opportunity to be heard. Uh, Ms. Kiss, would you please call the speakers? Yes, we'll begin with Richard Shave. Elena Macias, Gabriela Amel Peralta, and Renee Amel Peralta. My name is Richard Shave. I, I live on O'Sullivan Drive in University Hills across the street from Cal State Los Angeles's media building. I'm an alumnus from 2005, a degree in computer science. On Friday, January 14th at 2 a.m., I was woken by jackhammering coming from the campus below. Uh, several phone calls with campus police. About 30 minutes later, I was informed it was construction at the library. Uh, I've not come to seek redress on how it felt to be woken by jackhammering at 2 a.m. or how it felt to read the letter from an administrator later that morning explaining that the nighttime construction would continue for three more evenings. I've come to give public comment today seeking to redress this continuing gap in policy and operations on campus that continues to allow concerts measured at 105 decibels and heavy construction activities in the dead of night. What, what is on the table I put forward with the university is to please create the interface through which the university is going to solve these policy level problems which exist in our neighborhood. A vice president of student affairs to meet with our neighborhood in some sort of cohesive fashion to deal with sound problems from the student union, a robust sound policy and mechanical and structural improvements to baffle and control sound levels from the student union. I know that Cal State Los Angeles wants to be a good neighbor and, and there are lots of other problems which are below the level of what you need to hear about that we really would like to be addressed with parking. And I thank you so much for your time. gentlemen. Uh, thank you for bringing back to the board uh, the review of regarding AP 2000. Yesterday I used the law and reasoning to point out the bias that campuses use to deny AB 2000 to GED holders. Today I want to point out that if the CSU continues to exclude adult school graduates, our values. I hate to preach, but I must. Whose interest is served by denying GED holders access to AB 2000? What added worth is there when we deny the equivalency of adult basic education to traditional K through 12? What motivates the fear that it might open up the floodgates? I think it is a safe bet that none of us in this room are graduates of adult school. When we imagined K through 12, we all know what that was like because that was our experience. But not have an uninterrupted childhood. Some immigrants never step into a traditional K through 12, and even some who come here as teenagers are at times sent to alternative schools because their local high school does not have the requisite ESL classes or their situation is so desperate that they go straight into the workforce. So let me ask you to step into their shoes, see, their see how your exclusionary policies from the point of view affect the adult student. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. 
My name is Gabriela Mel Peralta and thank you for letting me speak again. Exceptions are always made. I was lucky to have been the last exception at Casted LA, if not the only one I know. Yesterday I shared with you that I transferred to Casted LA, however, I did not say how this was possible. A person whose identity will be anonymous helped me to be the exception and be classified as AB540 in 2013. The policy back then remains the same as today. No student who attended adult high school can be classified as AB540, which eliminates him or her from receiving state tuition. This was my case as a graduate student of adult high school, and I did not qualify as AB540, even though I did, I did three years of non-traditional high school. Students like me are viewed or considered by the CSU system as they do not belong here. Three, AB540 is only, is only meant for young people. If the person who, has, who was so gracious to help me had taken those three notions and applied it to me, I would have never been able to transfer to Cal State LA as it happened at Cal State Fullerton, which denied me AB540 status for having the diploma or equivalents of adult high school and not regular high school. Instead, this person convinced, convinced the registrar clerk to make an exception with me and qualified as AB540 student. I never happened to meet the clerk whom days after she uh, processed my paperwork retired. The person who convinced her to help me said that I was the last person she gave me AB540 status. 2013 was definitely a lucky year for me. Since then, no one I know has been allowed to receive qualified as AB540 with adult high school. This is unjust, this is discriminatory because an opportunity this, like this, many students can be future social workers like me and dream of pursuing not only bachelor's but master's and doctorate degrees. Ironically, the person who advocated for me back then stopped helping other students because the new registrar clerk go by the book and believes that only those students who attended traditional high school deserve to have AB540 status. In the last two years, I have seen the tenfold of students being denied AB540 students status and it's hard for me to look them straight in the eye and tell them I'm, I am sorry for you can't come to any Cal State because you do not qualify for financial aid relief through AB 540. Interestingly, I was afraid this will be the outcome if I will have done my master's at Cal State Long Beach, which has officially stated that will not accept none, any non-traditional high school. For this reason, I decided to stay at Cal State LA so that I could slide right into my master's and not confront another deception due to my adult high school status. Mr. Lastly, I say that even though I struggle because my case encompasses a non-traditional high school education, I am thankful and grateful at Casted LA and its staff for making an exception for me. Please, I urge the UC, the uh, CSU system to make the exception for other students once and for all. Help us to see more educated students regardless of their educational background and legal status. Thank you. Is Renee Amel Peralta here to speak? Okay. We'll have Pat Gant, Loretta Seva Aitasi, Neil Jacqueline, and Rafi Sanchez. <coughs> Good morning, um, I'm Pat Gant, President of the California State University Employees Union. Um, come here today um, with some comments that sort of go back to what our last meeting was about in some ways, where we were dealing with our access to this meeting with uh, several badges, bathroom passes, and I thought we had moved forward. Um, I had been in constant communication with Renee Castro with the uh, Labor Relations, and I thought we would fixed all the problems until I showed up yesterday. Um, and there appeared to be not a change in policy, the same policies out there, but a change in practice, where my uh, briefcase and 11 other briefcases of employees were confiscated when we went into the room because of the policy. 
I complied as along with other 11 people who were employees of the CSU system sitting on this side of the wall. I don't know what process the people on your side of the wall went through for security reasons, but it's sort of random security like this that raises more concerns than not. Um, that same bag that was taken, I was allowed to keep my, my iPad and my notes, uh, that same bag had cleared TSA security and was on a Southwest airline flight getting here. So what's the difference between Southwest and this? I don't know. So the point is, is that the change in practice, no notice in advance, we show up, we comply. The employee that took my bag is someone I represent. They're in my bargaining unit. They were put in a bad position. They did their job, I complied. But are we turning our employees into TSA agents, baggage handlers and that, and what are the training? So the end of the story is, I have received apologies from Vice Chancellor Lamb, Vice Chancellor Rea, and several other managers about the inconvenience and everything else, we move forward. But the problem is, the people on this side of the wall are employees and are treated much differently than the people on your side of the wall. That's significant to us because of the years of service and effort we put in to make the CSU better for the students. And this is how we're treated. I accept the apology, but the concern remains. Yesterday, we heard Chancellor White talk about the state of the CSU and inclusivity and opportunity. Since our last meeting in November, the CSU EU has run a survey on presidential searches. The simple questions are, what do you think of the search process and should finalists be uh, available or uh, presented to the campus community? There's over 1,200 responses across the system and 83% of the respondents support an open search with the finalists being presented to the campus community, much like it was in the past. Um, this isn't to change, no suggestion to change who the appointment authority is or who, who, who is selected by the trustees, but the openness and the inclusivity, the process, so the campuses can see who may be their next president. Some of the comments that were offered in the survey, the, candidate need, the candidates need to have conversations with people in the trenches ready to really learn what the environment of the campus is. The campus climate is so profoundly affected by the personality of the person at the top that everyone in the campus should be invited to participate in the process. And last, as John Kennedy said, a nation that is afraid to let its people judge the truth and falsehood in an open market is a nation that is afraid of its people. Don't be afraid of the campus community. Include them. Thank you for your time. Folks, just remind everybody to be mindful of the time. I want to make sure all of our speakers have time to be heard today. Thank you. Good morning, Chancellor White, Chair Monville, Board of Trustees, Campus Presidents, staff, and fellow union brothers and sisters. My name is Loretta Siva Itasi, VP for Finance for CSUU. When I stand before you and speak, I speak on behalf of the over 15,000 staff we represent in four bargaining units. Yesterday, I heard many board members give kudos to staff after presenting information on agenda items. Those staff members are vice chancellors and directors of human resources, finance, capital planning, financial aid, and so on. Each of them have staff that help them prepare the reports you see and listen to. Many managers will say they are only as good as the people who work for them. I'm sure the Chancellor, Chair Monville, each campus president will attest that they couldn't do what they do without their assistant. The person who keeps their calendar, reminds them of all things and prioritizes their day. Well, that's what we do for the CSU. I heard comments yesterday about a study of a department of 49 that basically determined 17 could do it all. Well, in a union environment, that's a layoff. However, more importantly, you as a board should know it's been happening already in the CSU. 
the hiring freeze of many years at the turn of the century due to bad economy. CSU has never recovered from 1992 budget crisis. I'll give an example. Custodians used to empty trash every day, vacuum and even touch up restrooms in the afternoon. Well, for many years now, they only empty trash three times a week and vacuum if requested, and public restrooms are only cleaned once per day. Our office staff are now trained because of this to now throw any food items in the trash in the restroom because it gets emptied daily. Custodians are assigned two to a building or sometimes two to two buildings without a drop in level of cleanliness. A college department office has one, only one office coordinator, our unit seven employees that assist the department chair, all faculty, schedules all classes, does employee transactions and faculty appointments, manages the department budget, not to mention the first contact for all students in all programs for that department. But yes, one person. Many times with no funds to hire student assistance and even work study is scarce. Sometimes someone retires in an office and the position is not filled, yet the work they, need, they did needs to get done. So what happens? Those left behind have to do it, but with no extra pay. And management doesn't care that this may result in less quality because one can only do so if, much, if you could which then remarks, leads please. to discipline instead of management prioritizing the work. We have some people that have, have, um, are not on the list anymore, so please, I'm almost done. Okay. I also heard yesterday about public-private partnerships. Last time I checked, we were a public institution of higher education, which should be funded by the state as the graduates of CSU go forth and contribute to California's economy. Also, these wonderful buildings erected with private donations require more staff for offices or to work assisting students, working for management and to support faculty. Every outstanding scholar will tell you of a faculty member who helped them achieve their goal. The beautiful landscaping is done by our five unit five ground crews, even the recycling. Shiny floors, clean bathrooms and offices are unit five, our custodians. Computer networks and telecommunications are our unit nine staff, as well as dean's assistants, budget analysts, procurement, payroll, library assistants, accounting, and more. Advising, financial aid, registration, career planning, outreach by our student services professional. Do you really know the human capital that works for you and what they do every day to make CSU run on a daily basis? Our president, Pat Gant, always says, welcome to leadership. This means as leaders, we have to make those tough decisions, but hopefully great decisions with the greatest positive impact for our members. So on behalf of our members, don't forget the recent past. It has not been rosy for your staff out on the individual campuses and cutting staff is not the answer. You should be adding staff or at least making sure the institutional knowledge is being passed on and the knowledge that's left is compensated adequately. I know because I've dedicated 26 years to serving this great institution. Every time you interact with your assistant and think of how valuable they are to you, think of us because we bring value to the CSU every day in every way. Food for thought, thank you. Good morning, I'm Rocky Sanchez, bargaining unit seven chair for CSUEU. Chancellor White, Board of Trustees, Presidents, I wish to follow up on yesterday's um, talk or two of my cohorts, uh, Susan Smith and Ricardo Unk regarding the IRP, the in-range progression. There's been some, cons well actually not just some, major concern regarding the IRP program and how the majority of the campuses HR departments chooses to misinterpret how the IRPs are given to employees. The employees that Loretta has just talked about that work very hard to make sure that the restrooms are clean, that they have had to pick up the pieces once somebody else has left and manage a department or take care of a budget. The misinterpretation means that they can, HR departments are denying 
on maybe an equity issue when that was not the way the, the request had been put in, that the request was put in over workload issues because somebody has left, or maybe they have had to develop new skills in, in order to deal with landscaping. Our, our members, CSU members, no longer trust the HR departments because they know that when they submit the paperwork, they're gonna be denied, be denied, and be de denied falsely. So I know, I need to know if this board is really concerned about it because this is our contract, not just CSU EU's contract, but all of our contract that we have to abide by. Thank you. Good morning. As you can see, this is a hot issue with us. We didn't collaborate on this, so I'm, I'm gonna basically speak on the same subject again. My name is Neil Jacklin, VP of Organizing for CSUEU. I'd like to inform you about an issue that is very important to staff who work throughout the CSU. And yes, I am talking about the in-range progression process again. Many of you have heard us talk about this issue before, and I'm sure it won't be, I won't be the last one to su suggest a need to improve the process, the approval process. I believe many of you do understand there is a problem, but due to past financial restraints and other factors, you were unable to correct this issue. As a result, it has made staff feel unappreciated for their hard work, and I surmise it didn't make their bosses and supervisors feel better. <coughs> Having to say, yes, you're doing a great job, but I'm sorry, HR, is telling me you don't qualify for an IRP. No, no further explanation, just you don't qualify. As a consequence, now most staff believe that the only way to get an IRP is if, like in the movie, The Shawshank Redemption with Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins, we must crawl through a sewer pipeline 500 yards to be qualified for an IRP. Please don't dismiss this issue and please take the necessary steps to reassess the process and improve it and make it make sense. Thank you. John Lee, Shanna Dyan, and Jennifer Egan. Hello everyone, uh, my name is John Lee from CSU Long Beach and I'm here to speak on behalf of COF, which stands for Campuses Organized and United for Good Health. I uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm here to recognize our president, Dr. Jane Close Connolly, for the adoption of a 100% smoke and tobacco free policy at CSULB and I applaud the other presidents from Fullerton, Northridge, San Diego, San Jose and Sonoma for the adoption and implementation of their 100% smoke or tobacco-free policies. At CSULB, we're looking forward to having a cleaner and healthier campus as we eliminate secondhand smoke and tobacco waste throughout our campus. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shauna Dayan and I am a student at San Diego State University and I'm also here to speak on behalf of COF. Thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to recognize SDSU President Dr. Elliot Hirschman for the smoke and tobacco free policy on our campus and the ongoing efforts to ensure the success of the policy. I also encourage all campus presidents to follow the lead of the campuses that are 100% smoke and tobacco free and adopt and implement stronger tobacco use policies to promote good health and well being at all CSU schools. I applaud the CSU Chancellor's Office for creating a task force to discuss smoke and tobacco policies on campus. I encourage the Chancellor's Office and Board of Trustees to adopt a system-wide smoke and tobacco-free policy. Thank you for your time. Hi, Jennifer Egan, CFA. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, concur with uh, some of the comments uh, from uh, CSUEU President Pat Gant. I think that uh, in terms of both policies here at the board and changes in policy that affect, uh, that affect faculty, they affect the way faculty do their work, they affect the way faculty are heard, they, and they affect uh, faculty financially as in the changes in the individual retirement accounts. Um, 
I think that I think that it seems as though the practice has changed uh, where you enact the policy and then apologize to us after the fact uh, for enacting it without meeting and conferring with us first. I would love for that policy to change if there are policies that affect the work and financial lives of faculty and staff that you meet and confer with the unions prior to enacting the policy and not after. And I'll retroactively re uh, cede my time to CSUEU. That concludes our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and my apologies. I didn't know that they had taken some folks off the list. So my, my apologies to our friends at CSUEU. Um, uh, as always, I appreciate everyone who dedicates the time and, and effort to travel and, and speak with us today. Um, if it uh, uh, would suit my colleagues, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to reorganize a, a bit of the agenda, um, uh, as is uh, the education of our students is our first priority. Uh, our very own uh, Taylor Heron has to get to class in Chico this afternoon. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, offer the floor uh, to uh, the chair of CSSA, Taylor Heron, to give uh, the report, her report first. Um, I don't want to be the one keeping her from that flight. So. Yes. So as much as I envy your job, Blue, I'm I'm not the chair. I'm actually the president. My chair is hanging right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. Yeah. And on behalf of all the students that try to scurry across the state to get to their classes in time, thanks for letting me. They're all nodding. Thanks for letting me speak. CSSA is really grateful for an opportunity to give a report here. When I write these reports, I always start after our meeting and you know put together a list of the things our students are working on then as the meeting goes for you know a day and a half by the time I get to the end I'm hoping to also share some stuff that's pertinent to the discussions that you all had, had here. CSSA met at San Diego State University this past weekend and is currently conducting our mid-year review of the goals and initiatives we've been working on since the start of the year. As CSSA continues to reaffirm itself as an association that's directly connected to the needs and experience of students on each of those 23 campuses, this process serves as a conduit for organizational accountability and ensures the work we are focusing on is. As we move into what is certainly the busiest time of the year for our organization, I'd like to start with projects and initiatives you'll see guiding CSSA's efforts in the coming months. Our legislative affairs teams will be leading the way with several major projects that share an overarching goal of advancing CSU advocacy at all levels of government. Our staff in Sacramento are working on statewide voter registration, engagement, and mobilization efforts for our student leaders so they can utilize them on their campus. Last week, we joined Chancellor White with the meeting with Secretary of State Alex Padilla to discuss the role of the CSU in increasing civic engagement throughout California and believe the work we have already started can be the foundation of a transformative partnership between the Secretary of State's office, the CSU, and CSSA. <clears throat> with the legislature back in session, our board's exploring several legislative sponsorship ideas for the student commissioners on CSAC, the Student Aid Commission, and the bill would do two things. It would cover tuition for the student commissioners so that they can fully commit to the work they've been asked to do, and it would also allow the outgoing student commissioner to stay on the commission up to a year if the governor has yet to appoint a new student. We believe these two ideas will help ensure that our student commissioners have the resources to focus on their work and that there will be always a student represented on the board. As we prepare for a CSU Hill Day and ongoing, oh, sorry, I'm gonna take a step back. So the second bill idea that we're working on has to do with access codes. Um, I'm sure most of you know what those are, um, but they are, uh, come with the textbook when a student buys them and allow them to access some sort of third party site or program that supports work that comes from that textbook. So we've heard directly from students that too often these access codes assigned to them do not provide additional value. They require our students really often to buy new books and continue to contribute to the high cost of textbooks in general. And so we started conversations with the Academic Senate and hoping to strike a balance between tack tackling student textbook costs while also ensuring the faculty have the ability to select the best course materials for their class. As we prepare for CSU Hill Day and ongoing student advocacy efforts in DC, there are two federal bills worth highlighting. During CSSA's lobby visits last fall, we worked to bring greater attention to the challenging situations our campuses who technically could qualify as both an HSI and an anapesi institution face when they have to make a decision about where they're going to receive their funding. We are, sorry. 
We are pleased to see the introduction of a bill that aims to resolve the, that exact issue, SB 2317, the Minority Serving Institution Fairness Act, and our Legislative Affairs Committee has voted to take a stance of support and make it a part of our ongoing act. Which was mentioned today is HR 3403, which is known as the Campus Safe Act. And it's been proposed in the House of Representatives to address the needs of campuses when responding to sexual assault of a student. CSSA has not only taken a stance in opposition of the bill, but finds it so concerning that our board has approved a detailed letter outlining what we see as detrimental implications of this bill if it were to become statute. Proponents of the Sa campus, Safe Campus Act of 2015 claim this bill would improve due process for respondents of sexual assault allegations. However, we believe this bill would strip survivors of sexual assault from the ability to pursue a campus investigation under Title IX without first reporting to the police. Requiring formal police reports as a prerequisite for a campus investigation fails to account for the considerable bias against victims of sexual assault in the criminal justice system, particularly victims on college campuses. This bias is what leads to an overwhelming majority of campus sexual assault cases never being reported to the police. Well, the Safe Campus Act does advocate for improvements to due processes for allegations. It fails to protect survivor's right to choose how and to whom his or her sexual assault is reported or allow a university to undertake measures that protect survivors. We do not in endorse the Safe Campus Act as written and we encourage our members of Congress to engage in further discussion regarding campus sexual assault legislation. The, count the CSSA supports this and we hope that as administrators and, and the Office of Federal Relations can support us in those efforts this coming spring. Our University Affairs Division is just as busy working on endeavors aimed at involving and supporting students within our, our system. And I'll spend the remainder of my report referencing the sustainability report and discussion that you had today. Uh, I, the trustees, you should have all received uh, a cover letter in addition to a resolution. Our board from the start of the year has been discussing this report in detail and has put a tremendous amount of time and energy into truly trying to contribute to the development of the report in a way. The document is five pages, which is extremely long. And we made a decision as an organization that we wanted to present something that was comprehensive rather than concise. And so I hope as trustees, you do take time to go through that letter and recognize that every comment in there is a result of something that a student said to us. Uh, but we were kind enough to include a one and a half page letter that also gets an overview and hopes to highlight the major components of the resolution that are, we think are most important to share today. So as you would expect, the most pointed concerns of CSU students mostly relate to affordability and are best described as a genuine fear that higher education will become something that's simply not an option for the underserved and marginalized students of the CSU. The California Higher Education Master Plan recommended the CSU be tuition free for all California residents and it's clear the state of California has strayed from that vision and promise. In the last decade, but when 77% of our CSU students receive some form of financial aid, three out of four of them are working at least 20 hours a week, Removing economic barriers for these students who've earned the right to access higher education while also mitigating financial bur burdens that too often prove detrimental for entire lifetime is what students want on the priority list. Making it the guiding principle that CSSA and the students are committed to above all else as this process moves forward. What's really important to note is no increase in tuition or fees is insignificant. We had a presentation on SUG yesterday and we see that almost 100, more than 100,000 of our students can expect little to nothing from their support at home. As I report to you, I share about the issues and initiatives that we work on and more often than not, they're about textbook affordability, food and housing insecurity. So when we're talking about a couple hundred dollars, that is concerning to our students to the extent that they have a fear that they're not going to be able to access and be successful in education. So we appreciate that the conversation is necessary and we commend the chancellor in being proactive, but the utmost level of transparency and inclusion is gonna be important as we move forward. The report brings attention to the uncertainty surrounding the CSU's financial future. It 
to build an educational system with the sole purpose of granting Californians access. The other major comment from students is the concern about what this means for the legislature and that it will ultimately lead to us receiving less and less support as time goes on and the financial burden truly falling on students. So our plan this year, as we move into our spring advocacy, is to use this report as a tool and to help bring attention and to hold our legislators accountable and to come together as an institution as we look internally to really protect our students and elevate them and put them at the center of this discussion. As we move forward, the discussion that are centered around the idea of requiring students to invest more money in their education, there's nothing more important than reaffirming the CSU's commitment to access by ensuring the policies on tuition, fees, and financial aid do not create these insurmountable barriers that we've talked about. As a system, we must evolve to be more stable and sustainable without ever straying from the principle that's the reason for the creation of the CSU itself. The promise that a person's privilege or lack thereof does not determine whether they can access and successfully earn a college degree. It's a message we'll be sharing in Sacramento and we hope that you join us this year in doing that. So that uh, concludes my formal report, but the chair and chancellor have been so kind to um, afford me an opportunity to recognize someone who's very important to CSSA. Miles Nevin, as many of you know, um, is our executive, executive director of CSSA and he will be leaving us in the next few weeks. So he attended his last meeting at San Diego State um, and will be transitioning out. So Miles, we'd like to invite you to the front of the room to present you with something, if that's okay. All right, so I was gonna give my report here, but I thought it would seem a little awkward, so thanks for letting me walk up. Miles started with CSSA as a student at Long Beach. He was a member of our board. I came on to work as staff and spent two years as a university affairs director and has been our ED for the greater part of six years. Miles' commitment to this organization has redefined it. It's taken us from one that uh, was primarily focused on legislative affairs to one that will start to serve and directly connect with the 500,000 students of the CSU. All I can say about Miles is just that he has done so much for me personally as a student and I'm really grateful for an opportunity to stand up here and speak on behalf of all the other students that he's done that for. So please join me in congratulating Miles and on his accomplishments and we look forward to seeing what he does and we're gonna miss him very much, but very excited and grateful for his leadership and, and opportunities moving forward. Thanks, Miles. So, no, it's okay, you can continue. We need Miles in a minute. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, President Heron, for a great report. It's what, see, it's what happens when I ad lib, right? I, you know, uh, my, my apologies. So I will uh, na now go back to, uh, to, to regular order and that leads us to, uh, to my report. You know, before I begin my, my typical report, I want to address an issue that has the potential to affect uh, this board's uh, future decision making. Um, in the past, the CSU has mitigated the impacts of facility construction and expansion by requesting funds from the legislature for local infrastructure. Um, as you are all aware on this board, um, a recent Supreme Court decision ruled that we cannot rely solely on legislative funds that are not guaranteed. As a result, we may now have to explore other funding sources for roads, intersections, or other off-site infrastructure when a campus wants to expand or build new facilities to, to serve our students. Shifting infrastructure costs traditionally borne by Caltrans or other local cities and counties to the university is a new policy 
with significant consequences that cannot be ignored. Campuses do not have adequate financial resources to support their current enrollments or to maintain or replace current facilities. This decision means that going forward, and will be for for decisions about how we best serve our existing and future students. Funds that otherwise could have gone toward academic programs, student success measures, teaching a diverse student body, and creating safe learning environment, in other words, the inclusive excellence the Chancellor talked about, will now need to be budgeted for off-site improvements. We must plan accordingly. Another reason why I believe the sustainable financial model recommendations we discussed yesterday are so important to the universities and our collective future. We must have an honest conversation with the governor and the legislature about the appropriateness of requiring the CSU to direct general funds, tuition, and other revenue, dollars that should go to serving students to fund local infrastructure. There's another quick item of business uh, for today's report. Um, the following, uh, I'll be appointing the following trustees to serve on the Committee on Committees. Deb Farrar will serve as chair, uh, Adam Day will serve as vice chair, and they will be joined uh, by trustees Norton, Monville, and Brewer. The Committee on Committees will ensure that our work reflects the diverse expertise of those who serve on this board. So thank you for those who are taking on this responsibility. And again, thank you to all of the members of the presidential search committees and congratulations to our president's elect. I would also like to take a moment to remember the victims of the violence that took place this past December in San Bernardino, which the chancellor mentioned yesterday. You know, 14 CSU alumni lost their lives or were injured on that day, nine of whom graduated from my alma mater, Cal State San Bernardino. We also lost members of the Fullerton, Pomona, and UC Riverside alumni families. You know, we've learned more about these vibrant, incredible people dedicated to serving their communities and representing the principles and ideals that define the CSU and indeed our country. People loved by their families and by their friends. Following the TAC, you might have seen this phrase on social media, SB Strong. SB Strong signifies the strength of a community to reject fear, hatred, and hopelessness, and in its place, embrace diversity and hopefulness to stand united. One does not have to look far to find evidence of that strength. I want to express my deepest thanks to the Cal State San Bernardino Police Department, uh, who made uh, certain that the immediate campus community was safe as part of a citywide response. President Morales, uh, on behalf of this board, please convey our thanks and appreciation to Chief uh, Jameson and her team uh, for that excellent work. The Chancellor spoke of our inclusive excellence and the notion that we rise together and celebrate in each other's victories. In that spirit, congratulations to the Cal Poly Pomona men's soccer team for a fantastic season. The Broncos finished the year with a dominant regular season record, won the CC2A tournament, and earned their program's first four victories ever in, CC, uh, in NCAA tournament play, and in historic fashion reached the national championship game. On the debate stage, San Francisco State's speech and debate team took home first prize at the Berkeley Speech Tournament, and SFSU students Janelle Murray and Aliyah Shahid beat the number one ranked team in the country, Harvard University, in a head-to-head -head competition during the California Policy Swing Debate Tournament. And from the debate stage to the studio, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association recently awarded a $2 million grant to Cal State Northridge, renowned Department of Cinema and Television Arts to support students and enhance technology. A portion of that grant will also create the endowed Hollywood Foreign Press Association Scholar, which will support underrepresented students in film and television. Staying in the world of cinema, two Sonoma State student filmmakers, Mary Madison Baldo and Anna Luna, were recently invited to screen two films at the prestigious Cannes Film Festival. The two films were produced by the University Studio 1063, a nine-student program made up of students from a range of majors. This is the second year in a row 
that student films produced by Sonoma State students will be featured at CAN. From the soccer pitch to the debate stage to the studio and even to CAN's France, Cal State students continue to innovate and, excel, you know, and excel in every field. Many of these opportunities outside the classroom are made possible by our generous donors. And today's report on system-wide philanthropic efforts uh, is indeed another shared success. I continue to be impressed by the creative ways our 23 campuses and the Chancellor's Office tell the CSU story, inspiring our philanthropic donors and champions to invest in our students, our faculty, and our staff. I particularly apl applaud the success of the Class of 3 Million celebration and the resulting growth in alumni participation and giving. As alumni trustee, I challenge my colleagues on the Alumni Council to build on this momentum as we strengthen the connection between our current and future alumni. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge that Speaker Adkins is ending her term as the Speaker of the Assembly in March, which will also end her service as a member of this board. As Speaker and as trustee, she has provided tremendous leadership for the state and the CSU. Yesterday, the Chancellor celebrated the fact that the legislature stood with us in last year's budget discussions. Without a doubt, Speaker Adkins made that possible. With that, I conclude my report. Chancellor White. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Monville. You know, I echo your words of appreciation for Speaker Atkins' leadership and service, and we are strongest when we stand united, and with the Speaker as our champion, we stood together as one. But I must say that I seek our partners in the legislature, Governor Brown, and our K-12 schools leadership and faculty, including charter schools, as Trustee Fortune mentioned this morning, to do their part, to help us achieve our moonshot, to eliminate to eliminate the graduation disparity among our students. Together, but only together, can we provide the opportunity to all Californians to serve California's economic, social, and environmental future. As mentioned earlier this morning, I also want to congratulate the two candidates chosen to lead San Jose State University and Sonoma State University. Congratulations to San Jose State President-designee Mary Papazian and Sonoma State President-designee Judy Sakaki. Mary, welcome to California and the CSU. Judy, welcome home. Thank you again to the Presidential Search Committee members for their hard work and valuable insight in regards to this process. At yesterday's State of the University, I told several stories about the power of inclusive excellence and in our founding mission of and guiding principles of opportunity, quality, and success. Today, let me tell one more story. Nearly 30 years ago, Mike and Robin Prime, longtime champions and donors to Chico State, were looking for an afternoon caregiver for their teenage son, David, who has autism. Mike and Robin were seeking someone to connect with David and help him to thrive. David's daily routine could be challenging as he must develop social skills one at a time, something that many of us take for granted. So when a family friend recommended former Chico State Wildcat soccer player Ben Pollock to be David's caregiver, Mike and Robin jumped at the opportunity. A lifelong bond was formed. Ben spent almost every weekday afternoon with David, helping him with chores and his daily routine. They went to the movies together, to friends' houses, and to Ben's soccer practices at Chico State. David soon became friends with many of Ben's teammates. After Ben graduated from Chico, the tradition of inclusion continued as another group of Wildcat soccer players stepped up to work with David after school to continue the friendship and tradition that Mike, Robin, David, and Ben had forged years earlier. To this day, the bond between David, Ben, and the Chico State men's soccer team remains strong. Mike and Robin have become diehard supporters of Wildcat soccer, attending every home game and often traveling across the country to see them play. And when David recently turned 40, former Wildcat players and coaches spanning nearly three decades showed up to celebrate with David. A prolific scorer, Ben Pollock was introduced into the Chico State Athletics Hall of Fame last year, 
and Mike and Robin Prime recently established the David Prime Soccer Scholarship, a gift they hope will inspire soccer alums to continue to give back to their communities. The Prime's gift, as with David's friendship with Ben and Chico State Soccer, illustrates that power of inclusive excellence that I touched on yesterday. Although the story is exceptional, its inherent values are anything but unique to the CSU. At the core of all of the stories I told yesterday and others have told over the time, the values and mission of the CSU, as one of our award recipients yesterday said, the spirit of CSU, the spirit of inclusive excellence, of opportunity, quality, and success. So as we continue to move forward in 2016 with the ambitious and attainable goals we set last year in the Graduation Initiative 2025, and as we continue to tell our story and encourage decision makers in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. to stand with the CSU, and as we continue to build relationships with our champions and donors who provide much needed philanthropic support for our campuses, and as we continue to push the conventional boundaries of student, faculty, and alumni achievement and defy expectations of what a public university can do. I hope that we can continue to come together under the shared banner and responsibility of inclusive excellence and continue to provide opportunities for quality, innovation, and achievement for our 475,000 students, our 47,000 faculty and staff, and our 3 million alumni. Chair Monville, that concludes my report. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, the report of the Academic Senate of the CSU, Chair Stephen Filling. Stephen? Thank you, sir. Good morning, all. I'm mindful of the first semester I taught at California State University 22 years ago. I was tasked with teaching intermediate accounting on a Friday night from 8 to 10. I feel a harmonic with the audience right now, given that I'm a major impediment to your proceeding to lunch. Please bear with me. One of the things our chancellor noted yesterday in his address was that in one sense, we might be in need of a shared commitment, a shared commitment to the citizens and students of California. I think one reflection of that commitment was enunciated by trustee Taylor yesterday. And pardon me if I misquote slightly, the uh, notion that He's willing to die in the sort of teaching as the primary responsibility of the CSU. That's a commitment that's shared by the faculty of the CSU, that's shared by the staff of the CSU, and most assuredly is shared by, we hope, our students. Another trenchant point from Trustee Taylor, the notion that perhaps we should be moving money into the classroom. We appreciate the thought that using my business background speak, we put more money into the production, production function of the CSU. It just makes sense. And perhaps the uh, Sustainable Financial Model Report provides some guidance on how to do that. One statement the Academic Senate made last week, I think speaks to that issue. It was a request that we find ways to recognize that California taxpayers are indeed contributors to the CSU. As I walk across campuses, I see buildings named for a wide variety of people. I haven't come across one named taxpayers, comma, CA yet. But perhaps one of the mechanisms we might use to further state support for our institution is to further the recognition of the value that those taxpayer dollars provide. In PBS speak, funded by viewers like you. Another statement of the Academic Senate last week spoke to the role of CSU campus faculty for transfer credit. This speaks to something I think near and dear to the faculty of the CSU, the reality that our 23 campuses are very distinct entities. Trustee Monville noted yesterday that maybe it would be good if algebra at Stanislaus was pretty much the same as algebra at San Luis Obispo. It is. The content is virtually identical. What is different is the presentation, the way in which we reach out to the students that we deal with, that has been and I hope will continue to be one of the core strengths of the CSU. As President Zing noted earlier, we take our students where they are and try to empower their change. The empowerment mechanisms change, the end goal remains the same. 
another one of our statements dealt with a reality. We have a lot of non-tenure track, what we refer to as temporary faculty in the CSU. We are asking our campuses and our central office to please ensure that those faculty are included in the orientation programs that we offer our faculty. We do so in pursuit of ensuring the quality of the education we provide for our students. In line with that, Chancellor White also remarked yesterday that it is indeed the faculty that are closest to the students. I think that's correct. And I think if you look at the uh, California State University Public Relations website this morning, you will find a new posting to their blog. It's a story about one of my colleagues at Stanislaus, Dr. Christy Gonzalez, the story of how she, as a first generation, didn't know she could be a student student to Stanislaus, got guided through that process by one of the faculty there, and in turn became a faculty member and director of our faculty mentor program and has guided countless students through the same process. It is indeed the faculty that are closest to our students. It is those relationships we need to nurture. In pursuit of that, the Academic Senate is asking the Chancellor to convene a tripartite task force to develop an action plan to deal with the issue of tenure density. We've noted in the past that we all seem to agree it's a problem, and I'm glad there's consensus. I think it's perhaps time that we do something. As an example of why, Chancellor White noted yesterday that we had hired 742 new tenure track faculty last year. I'm very happy about that. However, I'd also note that maybe it's not such good news when we note that 500 of those faculty were replacing faculty who had left last year. That is, if we choose to make a dent in the tenure density problem, we need to develop a plan and act upon it. As an example of scope, Tim also noted that we are at an all-time high for faculty. That's true. However, we have about 100 less tenure-track faculty than we did in 2005. We have several thousand more part-time temporary faculty, and those are not the people that can develop long-term relationships and transform students' lives. That is, they're not the people that will do what we need them to do unless we enable them to become long-term employees of the university. Trustee Fortune, you mentioned earlier today that it would be really good for higher education to engage in conversations with K-12 about what it is we think that students should have as they enter the CSU. I'm happy to note that one of our statements was an acceptance of the uh, Intersegmental Council of Academic Senates, that is the group of UC, CCC, and CSU faculty who just approved a statement on uh, what it is we think incoming students should have in terms of natural science preparation. That statement's the result of several years of work across the segments, across a wide variety of faculty. It is, I believe, available via web link, which should be in your materials. It is a statement that we have talked about with the K-12 folks quite a bit, and we hope it helps them understand where we need our students to be that so that we can take them further. I'll note that relatedly, Trustee Stepanek mentioned earlier today a uh, push for four years of math in high school. We concur in the need for that. It would offer the additional thought that one of those classes needs to be in the senior year. That is, we need a sort of constant exposure and progression to math as things go along. Finally, we uh, requested that the Chancellor's Office return the Research and Scholarly Creative Activity Fund to status as a line item in the budget. About a decade ago, when budget crises hit, that was removed. The Chancellor has gracious, graciously provided funding for that every year. However, we'd like it to become a regular part of the budget to enable the campuses to plan effectively. Returning perhaps to the tenure density issue, I'd like to uh, share with you Speaker Atkin's statement on Chancellor White's address yesterday. 
Chancellor White's State of the Sea issue address reminds us that California's economy and future are closely linked to the success of the university and its students. I applaud Chancellor White for his leadership in working to improve outcomes for students, especially those from underserved communities. It's important that CSU recognize that those improved outcomes will only come about if the university makes the kind of real commitment it takes to recruit and retain a strong faculty. Chair Monville, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Pilling. Uh, now for the report of the system-wide alumni council, Dia Poole, President Dia Poole. Thank you, Chair Monville. Uh, first, I'd just like to echo your remarks on the events in San Bernardino last December as an alum of uh, that campus and also as an uh, Inland Empire resident. We were just shocked and saddened at the loss of our alumni and on behalf of all alumni and all the campuses affected, we want to extend to the families our heartfelt thoughts and prayers for continued comfort and recovery. I also want to share in your excitement over the success of the Class of Three Million celebration and the alumni giving and participation results. We accept your challenge to keep the momentum strong in engaging our alumni as key partners in student success through giving of their time, talent, and treasure. For the presidents, I'd like to extend my special thanks to your campus alumni relations directors who were the heart and soul of this celebration and continue to drive its success. Let me provide you briefly with an update on the alumni trustee election process. We received excellent nominations from the campuses and have selected semi-finalists who will be interviewed here in Long Beach next week. From that group, finalists will be selected and will be interviewed by the full Alumni Council Board of Directors at their April meeting where the next alumni trustee will be elected. At that same meeting on the evening of April 8th at CSU San Bernardino, the Alumni Council will host a reception and dinner in honor of Chair Monville's 10 years of service on the Board of Trustees. You all should have received a save the date and formal invitations will be coming next month. We hope you're all able to join us for this outstanding opportunity and event uh, recognizing Lou's contributions. In November, I shared with you the Alumni Council's focus on sharing stories surrounding legacy, the legacy of the CSU transforming lives through generations of families. Our guest speaker at that meeting was a two-generation alumni family. I strongly believe that seeking out and telling these stories is key to our goal of keeping alumni connected and inspiring our next generation of students. A true living example of the power of CSU legacy is with us today, Tony Kawashima. Many of you may recognize Tony here as our official photographer at many CSU uh, Chancellor's Office events. And that's the thing about the CSU, you don't have to go far to find an alum with an amazing story. Tony served eight years on the Tustin City Council, including a term as mayor in 2004. Tony's legacy at CSU stretches across three generations and three campuses, Long Beach, Fullerton, and Cal Poly SLO. Thank you for joining us today, Tony. Thank you, Dia. Mm -hmm. Chair Monville, Board of Direct uh, Trustees, Chancellor White, mm -hmm. campus presidents and staff, thank you for this opportunity to tell how the CSU has impacted my family. It's an educational partnership that really stretches three generations. And it all starts, I'll start at the beginning with my mother, Elsie Kawashima, who because of her poor health could not attend, but I did my best to interview as a journalism major to get part of her story. Uh, my mother really is a product of the 50s. Uh, she was married at 19, had three children by 23. And at that time, women really had four basic careers, she told me. You either became a nurse, a teacher, secretary, or housewife. My mom became a housewife. And did that all through, as I remember, up to middle school until one day, one night actually at dinner, my mom made a announcement that she enrolled in college. And we were kind of stunned, but we were all very supportive about it. And to her, it wasn't really for a career. It was just really unfinished business because at 19, she had to raise a family and never had a chance to pursue a career or an education. So for the next four years, our living room basically became her study room, it piled with books and paper. She was an English major. And the impact, well, she learned really where I learned the skill of multitasking. Not only did she have to cook dinner 
for the family, kept up with the house and our homework. When we were all in bed is when my mom would do her homework for classes at Long Beach. Uh, really her CSULB experience really opened her eyes. She went to classes probably during probably most exciting times. It was during the late 60s at the height of the Vietnam War. So my mother being a housewife since she was 19, be thrown into this environment. She recites how a typical day on campus, she would hear often Tom Hayden speak against the war, Cesar Chavez, Eldridge Cleaver, uh, we'd have, she'd have the anti-war people with the veterans. And always, I believe on Friday, she talked about the Hare Krishna people were always in front of the bookstore chanting and singing. So it really was uh, quite the experience for my mother and it had long term impact on her in terms of her view of the world and how she would see things. From that generation, which is my wife, Ellen, who's a graduate of Cal State Fulton class of 1983, and myself, Cal State Long Beach, 1977. And that's me on assignment for the Daily 49er. I was photo editor, shaking hands with jo Governor Brown the first time around, which was the old chancellor's office on the other side of the street. My wife, Ellen, was a liberal studies major and for her college, as she told me, really, she was a very shy person, but college really helped her communication skills, uh, learned how to multitask, gave her confidence, and she now has worked 25 years in the insurance industry. My degree was journalism. As I mentioned, I was on the Daily 49er. Uh, I really credit my education at Long Beach State as giving me the foundation for my career as photography. It's my life and really it's my passion on vacations I take pictures, it's, it's what I live for. Um, I also learned very important skills in problem solving and, mass, and multitasking. It wasn't until probably two years ago I had an epiphany where I used to loathe my math classes in college. Being a photographer, I, mean, I thought math classes were senseless, but it finally struck me that the reason I took these math classes, it gave me the ability to problem solve, just take something complex and break it down into simple logical steps to solve. And surprisingly, it, it took me that long to realize that and that helped my foundation in problem solving. My pride and joy is the third generation of my family, my two sons. My older one, Matt, is on the left is a graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, class of 2013. His major is urban planning design. And I really appreciate the theme. I will never forget it of Cal Poly. It's learned by doing. And he was hired two months out of college by a environmental consulting and design firm in Monterey. Hired that their firm, he's probably the, it's a firm of about 20 people. He's the fourth Cal Poly student to be hired by the firm and how Cal Poly students are so sought after. They really like the Cal Poly students. And he took, he won the job over quite a few applicants who have master's degrees from uh, the UC schools. It's just that his practical experience at Cal Poly prepared him immediately to hit the ground running and start working. So that we we're ever forever grateful for that. The young man on the right is my younger son, Doug. He's 22. He's Cal State Fullerton class of 2015. He is a communications major. Um, he aspires to be a firefighter and two months ago, he just received his EMT certification. So he's on his step slowly towards his goal. He really, what we really enjoyed about Cal State Fullerton, he took part, and I could go on further about this, he participated in the UC, CSU Study Abroad, Abroad Program. And his sophomore year of college, he spent one year in Uppsala, Sweden, studying abroad. And that program, as a parent, changed his life so much. Studying abroad, it gave him confidence, maturity, 
uh, it was the first time that he was away from home and to be thrown into a country and Swedish is a very complex language without knowing the language he had to get along changed him into a very self-sufficient young man and so the study abroad program is a program we really uh, are very thankful for so in conclusion it's very obvious that our family bleeds csu that's an understatement the fact that we are three generations speaks for itself uh, as parents we always want the best for our children but yet both my wife and I work, we always want the best value too. What's the best value we get for our dollar? And without a doubt, patient to recommend a CSU. And if I may go out on a limb, my wife and I were very active in high school when our kids were in high school. I was PTO, Booster Club, Ed Fund. And one of the, when I was a board member of our PTO, our task was to try to bring parents to participate. And, our high school in Irvine was a very wonderful high school, which is a melting pot of different, it was 40% Asian, and it's, it's a real mixture, it was wonderful. But a lot of the, most of the kids, parents were first, they were first generation of parents from the old country. So our chore was to try to get these parents involved in school and education. And a lot of the parents maybe did not speak English well, but they all, especially, uh, I can say this because I'm Asian, but the Asian parents from Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, they may not know English very well, but they knew one word, you see. Drove me crazy. <laughs> you know, they all knew their kids had to go to a UC school. So I would endlessly debate with them and try to tell them, well, there's more than just UC, but it was, it was a fascinating point from a parent who participated in the process, how they have this, it's almost a mystique, and don't get me wrong, my sister went to UCLA, so I, it's a very fine school, but how many of these parents, you know, that's the only thing in the mind, is either UC, and how often going to a CSU is almost a, like second tier, and it was a, really a point of contention for me, so that's something that would always you know, I would always defend the CSU. So again, thank you very much for letting me speak. It's again, I, both my boys have a desire to stay in California. So I would imagine eventually when I become a grandparent, I will see the fourth generation of the CSU attend. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for sharing your family's powerful CSU story. You truly exemplify the spirit of the CSU that our fellow alum, Dr. Hamden, spoke of yesterday during the Wong Awards. I also want to congratulate all of the award winners from yesterday. President, my search is on for a fourth generation family, so I may be snooping around a campus near you <laughs> looking for them. If you know them, let me know so we can continue to highlight these wonderful stories. Thank you, Chair Mamba. This concludes my report. Thank you, President Poole. It's now time for the board to consider the consent agenda, which consists of the approval of the minutes of the November 2015 meeting and the approval of the resolutions that were passed on our committees yesterday and today. All of the committee items requiring full board approval are listed on the consent agenda. Does any trustee wish to remove any item from the consent agenda for individual discussion or consideration? Uh, Chair Monville, I don't want to remove any item, but I would like to, for the record, be Recorded as voting no on the item from the Committee on Organization and Rules, if that's okay. So noted. Thank Great. you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Trustee Taylor. Hearing that none to be removed, may I have a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda? Is there a motion? So moved. The motion and a second. All those, uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And if you'll make the note on, on uh, Trustee Taylor's request, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Um, with that, it's now uh, time for our discussion agenda, and the board has uh, two action items on today's discussion agenda. Uh, the first is a really special treat uh, for all of us, and uh, it's the conferral of the title of Trustee Secretariat Emerita to Ms. Leticia Hernandez. Um, <clears throat> Leticia was more than a secretariat. She was a friend. Um, she was a, a trusted advisor um, uh, who uh, could always, uh, you know, 
There's so much volume of data I think we all know that we deal with here and we always have questions and she could always steer us to the right person to help us get to the bottom of, of what we needed. Um, in addition, uh, with all due loving respect to my colleagues, we're a, we're a lively bunch. And then having to cater to our personal needs, our travel needs, getting us all around 23 campuses. At any given time, there's 20 of us on 20 different campuses. The logistical nightmare is unimaginable. Uh, and she did it uh, with a joyful servant leader's heart. And um, there was never a request that I can remember that I made or I ever heard a colleague made that she didn't say, we'll figure it out, we'll get it done, we'll take care of it. So while uh, it, it is sad to say goodbye, on the other hand, I am remarkably uh, grateful to know uh, that Letitia has many hobbies and passions that she is going to now have tons of time uh, to pursue. I noted today when I got to give her a big hug um, how tan and rested she looked. And I wish her many more years of happiness getting to do all of those things that she set aside so that she could take care of all of us. So with that, the conferral of the title of trustee um, uh, Trustee Secretary Emerita, Emerita to Miss Leticia Hernandez is an action item before the board. May I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The action item for the conferral of the title of Trustee Secretary to America, Emerita to Leticia Hernandez is approved. If she would join us at the podium. We have a we have a beautiful uh, a beautiful resolution here, uh, and I was just gracefully asked not to read all the whereases. So I will uh, I will do as requested. So often she was only carrying out my requests. I will offer I will take one today and just be resolved by the board of trustees of the California State University that the title of trustee secretary to America be conferred upon Leticia Hernandez with all of the rights and privileges thereto this January the twenty seventh two thousand and sixteen. Well, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the trustees, especially. I want to thank um, my staff, not my, well, my staff, Monique, and everybody, all the staff in the building, because all those people that worked and uh, put together the agenda made me and made my job look easy and made it look like I was doing a lot of work, which I wasn't. Everybody else was doing everything. <laughs> but I want to thank the board. Uh, it was my honor and a privilege to serve the CSU. And to serve this board, um, I thank you for this honor. He's here. Always wonderful to see you. Uh, Chair Monville has to step out, so I'm taking over from, for the moment. Um, our next item is the approval of a resolution adopted earlier today by the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel. For that item, I turn to Committee Vice Chair Trustee Obrego. Earlier today, the Committee on University and Faculty Personnel passed a resolution approving an exemption from the post-retirement employment waiting period for Dr. Andrew Z. Mason. That resolution now needs full board approval. On behalf of the committee, I move the resolution as stated in the agenda item. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, the action item is approved. <coughs> the board is now going to adjourn into closed session to discuss executive personnel matters. The board will reconvene. Uh, 2016 at our next regular, regularly scheduled meeting. Notice of the meeting will go out in the ordinary course 10 days in advance.
University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly.